on me. What happened next? That nigga came to court and told on me. Put that on so I saw my soul, homie. Called the highway patrol on me. Plus the sheriffs and cops. He told him my name was Eric and I carried a Glock. Soon let you start blowing shots and niggas going to tail. Don't have a meeting with the cops and then you going to jail. They'll tell him about the shooting, take him, show him his well. DA trying to see your cash, they gon' throw him the nails. They wanna throw me up in the cell and have me with a L again. Back to strip searches and guards read my mail again. Have me far away in the bay. I'm talking Pelican. Eating cold ass soy burgers and warm gelatin. I'm far too intelligent to fall for that twice. Niggas yelling gang gang. And ain't about that life And they'll turn rat right in front of your face Get your found guilty plus a hundred years on the case Your mama in the court with tears running all on her face Her baby shackle feet, hands and waist God damn, these niggas ain't Say what's cracking YouTube It's your boy 16 to life And I'm back like I'm on a pro violation Yard down Now for those of y'all that's new to my page In 1994 I got arrested I was eventually sentenced to 16 years plus life and I ended up serving 24 years straight in the California prison system. During those times, I accumulated some good stories and some good insight on things related to prison. I'm going to share some with y'all today. In the event you happen to like the video, be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit that notification bell. That way, anytime I drop a story, you will be notified ASAP. And you can hop on it whenever you're ready, man. Also, like I told y'all, man, the flow is nothing like Curtis Blow. Yeah, that's me gassing on the intro, man. I also got a song called Never Gave Me Therapy. It's on all major streaming sites. If you want to hear more of my music, go to my YouTube playlist, scroll down to gas stations, and you will find a lot of my music there. Now let's hop right up into this story right here, man. So uh, maybe about a week, week and a half ago, I know many of you guys that follow the uh, prison genre YouTube videos or whatever, you may have seen other channels talking about an incident where um, a prisoner who was visiting um, his girlfriend in the visiting room at Lancaster, I guess he had smuggled some razors out there or some type of cutting instruments and slashed his girlfriend in the, in the uh, visiting room pretty bad. Now, that definitely was an eye razor because um, over time, um, well, not necessarily over time, just period, the visiting room has always been off limits to violence. It's been an unwritten rule that, you know, um, the visiting room is off off limits to violence. You know, you have you have convicts out there visiting their wives, their mothers, their girlfriends, their little children, and that's just something that, you know, we do not want to put in front of our families and our loved ones. In my entire 24 years, um, I never seen any violence in the visiting room. Um, I heard of an incident that transpired between two black gangs who have a um, long history of, of going back and forth. I heard of an incident that happened at another prison. And when I was visiting one time, I happened to see this dude arguing with his girlfriend outside on the patio. And he became upset and threw some Pepsi on her. Um, but that's about the extent of violence that I've seen in the, in the, in the uh, visiting room. And like I said, I only heard of one particular incident. So, um... When I get into this information, because I know who this dude is, I know what gang he was from, how much time he had, so on and so forth. I'll share that with you guys, or at least some of it. Um, I don't want anybody by any stretch of the imagination to think that I'm agreeing with what he done or I'm condoning what he done. I'm just going to give you some facts, and then I'm going to give you some, some um, I guess, some of my thoughts on what possibly could have made this dude crash out like that, because he definitely did crash out right and so um like i do in most of my videos i'm not gonna put the dude's name out there you know i know several individuals i've been talking with a couple dudes who actually know this dude who did time with him and uh so it it come come to find out this dude he was a black dude he was a blood from the city of san bernardino and that's as far as i'll go on that information right there right um he had seven to life he was on a sentence of seven to life. You know, actually, he got locked up when he was 16 years old. I want to say around 1992. He was incarcerated because he had a carjacking robbery. So actually, while he had a life sentence, he didn't even have a, a murder case, right? And so um, he had he had a very good chance of getting parole from prison. Actually, his initial parole date 
was 1997. So he possibly could have been out long ago. Obviously, when he was in prison, he has uh, basically been shooting himself in the foot by getting in trouble, getting in violent incidents, so on and so forth, right? So the dudes who I spoke to who know him quite well, right, they say by all accounts, man, he's definitely um, what most would consider a stand-up prisoner. He's with the business. Obviously, he's very violent. He doesn't have a problem with violence when uh, it's it's necessary, which sometimes it is in prison, but of course never on the people that's visiting you, right? And so um, so initially, like I said, he got locked up at the age of 16 um, in 1992. He was initially sent to California Youth Authority. And for those who are not familiar with what California Youth Authority is, it's basically a prison for young adults between the ages of 18 and 25. And then if you if your sentence carries past that, once you become 25, they may send you on to the California prison system, right? And so like um, like the California prison system, in this California Youth Authority, you can't accumulate negative points or, um, you know, write-ups due to um, bad interactions that you may have with staff or other people housed in the California Youth Authority. And due to him coming to jail young, wild, immature, and with a gang-related mentality or a gang ideology that he embraced, he got into several, you know, he got into several incidents in prison that was, uh, excuse me, in California Youth Authority that was viewed negatively um, against him, right? So, unfortunately, August 9th, 1996 you had a counselor who was working at the california youth authority her name was inisi baker she was a black woman and unfortunately she was either pushed or lured into a utility closet by another dude who was being housed at the california youth authority she was beat over the head with some type of object she was also cut and unfortunately she lost her life then the dude who done that somehow um took her body placed it into a dumpster and got her to the outside dumpster and put her body in the dumpster. Um, a day or two later, when she had not arrived at home, her family called up there and was wondering about her whereabouts. You know, it was said that she would sometimes work overtime or whatever, but once she didn't show up at home at, after a certain period of time, uh, investigation uh, ensued ap about her whereabouts. Um, eventually, her keys was discovered in the room of the dude who done that and eventually her body was found in a in a landfill several miles away from the institution you know and so he was charged and he was all the dude who did it was a white dude who was already in there for murder upon this incident happening at the youth authority um a lot of those dudes who was being housed there who had m numbers and i'm not quite familiar with what an m number is because i have never been to california youth authority but they were deemed no longer fit for uh, the California Youth Authority, and they were sent off to prison. And so when they were, when that group of dudes was sent off to prison, this guy who stabbed his girlfriend in the visiting room was one of those dudes who was deemed no longer fit. And from there, he made his way to Folsom. Um, his whole entire stay, he was only on four yards. I believe he's been in prison probably, like I say, somewhere around, what, 32, 33 years, uh, whatever since 1992 is, the math on that, you know. 32 years, somewhere around there. And so uh, he was, you know, he was being shipped back and forth to these level fours, which are extremely violent um, at times. And so uh, I had a partner, man, who was actually in Salinas Valley with him one time. And like I said, this dude, he was a blood. And um, he always, you know, was in the mix, getting his bread, doing what he was doing. And like I said, he had a life sentence, man. He had seven to life. And so, you know, sometimes when, you, when you're locked up with a life sentence, initially, of course, Back in those days, 91, 92, uh, in the 90s, you know, 2000s, um, if you had a life with parole in the California prison system, the board was not, uh, the board was not paroling anybody. And so um, they were systematically denying pretty much 99.9% .9 of the people that went in front of the board. So, of course, knowing that situation also has a potential to affect a person mentally to where he feels, okay, I'm not going home. I'm locked up in prison on, on a, on a four-yard among the worst of the worst, so I have to act accordingly to be accepted and to also survive. And so, yes, you know, he got into numerous incidents. My homie told me about an incident where he was on the yard with him in Salinas Valley. Um, the dude had sold some weed uh, to another blood. The blood was not 
the blood had not paid him in, I guess, in the time that they had agreed upon. So the blood who attacked his uh, girlfriend in the visiting room, they're out there. They're chilling on the yard one day. It's several bloods around, L.A. bloods, I.E. bloods. They over there, you know, kicking and smoking weed. So um, now the weed is from the dude who attacked his girlfriend. You know, he has the sack, so he's passing weed around. So now the dude who he had gave some weed to previously and who hadn't paid him, he said, hey, man, let me, you know, let me hit the weed or whatever. Dude tell him, no, homie, you still owe me from that other stuff. You ain't paid me yet. You know, and so the dude who asked to hit the weed, I guess he thought that the dude was joking or, or whatever and said something. But like I said, the other dude is very serious about his business. And all of a sudden, boop, pop, boop. He just two-pieced the dude or whatever, you know, get off on him, knock the dude down. Now, of course, when he knocked him down, his homies are telling him, hey, man, now you got to go get that. What was that about? You got to catch that fade. The dude is telling him, hey, man, this dude owe me money, whatever, whatever. So it's agreed that these two dudes are going to go catch a head-up fade. So I guess they walk around a certain part of the track. I believe um, the dude, both of the dudes had one of their homies with them, you know, to watch the fight or whatever, whatever. At some point in time, the dude who had got two-piece, pulls out a knife, even though it was agreed that it was just supposed to be a head of fight. So when he, when they pull out the knives, the two different factions um, start fighting with each other and a riot ensues between the LA Bloods and the IE Bloods, so on and so forth. Um, also, I heard about a couple of years ago um, in Delano, also the dude who attacked his girl in the visiting room um, also attacked his celly uh, very viciously um, in Delano. And so, you know, the dude was constantly, you know, um, caught up uh, getting himself in trouble, you know, and, and, and lengthening his stay in the prison system. But now he also had, you know, he had also had accumulated some college degrees, so it wasn't all bad in there for him, you know. Uh, he was doing some positive things, but, you know, um, when you're on that level four, you know, you you affiliated with a certain particular car at some point in time, man, it's going to be violence, you know. And, and so a lot of times being locked up, you know, we, we, we embrace a certain ideology and we feel that when things happen and they involve our car, we have to be involved, you know. And so for whatever reason, you know, this dude just continued to get in trouble and lengthen his stay. And like I said, his initial parole date was 1997. Um... Maybe, I don't know, around 2007, 2008, somewhere around there, they came up with a lot of laws that was extremely helpful in helping individuals under the age of 25 um, get paroled if you had life, you know. So they did some studies and they discovered or they came to the conclusion that certain parts of the brain that's responsible for the, in, that's responsible for the control of impulsivity, certain parts of the brain that's responsible for remorse and being fully aware of a person's actions had not um, matured until the age of 25. And so uh, upon discovering that, if you happen to come to jail under the age of, initially it was 18 and then it was extended to 25. But if you happen to come to jail under the age of 25, they gave great, um, they gave great thought about that. And so it, it was extremely helpful when a person who had life went in front of the parole board. So I say all that to say he fit the criteria. He definitely, definitely could have been out a long time ago. He's been locked up 32 years. I'm sure he's in there talking to dudes that he had been locked up with. He's seen dudes going home and all that weighs, all that weighs on a person, right? And like I said, he never had a, he never had a, a murder. So he, the first person I seen who had life, who was found suitable for the parole board and they told him he could go home was a dude who was in there for um, a kidnap robbery. So he definitely had action at going home long, long time ago. So now, you know, you're still locked up. You're talking to people who had life like you. They're free. They're telling you how good it is out here. You know, all that, all that, you know, just weighs, weighs heavily on the mind. I'm sure he was trying to get out doing things, you know, back in the courts or whatever. And it's just a lot of, a lot going on. And then also, right, being in a relationship while you're incarcerated is extremely hard, you know. Um, to keep it real, um, most of us dudes wouldn't be faithful to our women while we're free, you know. So imagine, imagine our women going up, getting locked up, you know, getting a life sentence. We, we're gonna be, we're gonna be cheap. We're gonna be entertaining other women. And to keep it 100, you know, it's a double standard with a lot of men. It's hard for a lot of men to accept. There are women doing things that they would be doing. Not saying that this is the case here. I'm just throwing some, I'm throwing some scenarios out there, right? So whatever it was, it's always hard to have a long distance incar incarcerated relationship. And so, you know, once again, 
you locked up from this age of 16, you've been in there 30 some years, your kids are growing, your parents is getting old, family members may be passing away. After a while, you know, just being locked up, it, it becomes a whole lot. You know, as convicts, we try to keep our head up. We, we try to put on a certain face when we hit the yard. But for some people, it weighs heavily than others. So um, fast forward to this day that he attacks his girl in the visiting room. Now, in my mind, and this is just me speculating right here. Obviously, it had to be something that he planned on doing. And because when we go, when we go to get visit, when we go on a visit, we get a light pat down. It's a light pat down and, you know, we spread our arms. They just pat us down. We don't have to strip search or anything like that. So it's easy to conceal a weapon, a razor blade or whatever. Right. And so now when we come out, we have to undress, take all our clothes off, lift up our legs, our arms, our hair, our, put our tongue out, run our fingers through our mouth because the system is more worried about the introduction of contraband. Um, as opposed to somebody going out there taking some contraband out there or doing something like this, right? And so, uh, and like I say in my mind, it had to be something that that was eaten away at this dude because, you know, it wasn't a spur of the moment thing. He didn't, he wasn't concerned. I mean, even if he wanted to just go out there and just bust her up, you know, give her some lefts and rights, you know. So it had to be deeper than that. It had to be something big going on that made this dude feel okay because basically what it was is this. In my opinion, that move is, okay, I'm going to show you. You know, I'm going to show you. You know what I'm saying? So he took the razors out there. So it was already in his mind what he was going to do. So it had to be something that was going on in the background, right? Because like I said, if he wanted to, he if he had got mad or he just wanted to, you know, he was already mad before he went out there. He could have just, you know, gave her some lefts and rights, even though I'm not condoning that. So, But I'm saying that for him to uh, come up with this devious plan to go out there and slash her, it was basically something that he wanted to try to scar her for life, <clears throat> in my opinion, right? So he gets the razors out there, and eventually during the visit, he attacks her, he cuts her, he slices her, right? So I don't know at what point in time he done this. Um, I just know that it happened, right? And so, of course, that's extremely disrespectful, for one, because you have other people out there visiting, right? Some people only get visits once every four or five years, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes I've been in there with friends who have been in jail 15, 20 years and had never received a visit, you know. And so anytime I went on a visit, that time was precious, you know, being able to see my family and spend time with them. So let's just say he goes out there. The visit started maybe nine, eight, nine o'clock. Let's just say he goes out there. Let's just say he goes out there and he attacks her at 10, 11 o'clock. You know, now you have. Basically, because they're going to shut visiting down. So now all these people who have come to visit their families uh, or their families that have come to visit them, that's canceled. You know, sometimes, you know, you may have people that's coming from four or five hours away. And so they may get up early in the morning, uh, come out there, rent a hotel. You know, so a visit can be a visit can cost, you know, five, six hundred dollars, depending on the length of travel you have to go through the the um, the uh, the renting of the hotel rooms and all that type of stuff. And so. Um, and of course they just didn't, they just didn't shut the visiting down for that day. They shut visiting down for the whole weekend, at least if not, if not, if not for several weeks, but at least that, that weekend, right? So all this affects other people. So of course you're going to have other convicts out there extremely angry and upset with this dude. Um, and, and also, you know, you may have had some people who was family was sitting in close proximity to the attack and their families witnessed this, their children's witnessed this and stuff. So it just, yeah, that, that definitely was a, um, a horrible decision. Definitely was a horrible decision on this part. And, you know, it could possibly, you know, have him, um, on the, uh, bad side of, of, of several convicts, you know, um, in the future, who knows, right? I do know he had a parole board hearing coming up in 2026, right? And like I said, not too long ago, he had got into a very violent incident with his celly. Um, and now on top of this, so he has definitely just guaranteed himself pretty much a 15 year denial, you know? Um, so when you go in front of the board, they can deny you for, they can tell you to come back in three years, five years, seven, 10, or 15 years. So imagine doing 33, 34 years. And then the board tells you, hey man, come back in 15 years, you know? So in my opinion, he was selling the ranch. He already knew what it was, you know? He had been to the board several times and unfortunately for that person and the person that he attacked, and 
for everybody in that visiting room, man. For whatever reason, this dude had lost hope. He had gave up hope. He has, I guess, pretty much, um, he has, in his mind, he has just said, hey, man, you know what? It is what it is. This is, this is where I'm going to be for whatever reason. This person extremely angered him, and it was like, I'm going to show you moment. It was a, I'm going to show you moment. I'm going to show you not to play with me, so on and so forth. But the dude just sold the ranch, man. But anyway, that's unfortunate, you know. Uh, but like I said, you know, a lot of times when we go to prison, we don't go because we are going. We don't go to prison using our best thinking, man. Anyway, you already know what it is. It's your boy 16 to life. Resume normal program.